Good morning, Advanced Church. Thank you, worship team, for just leading so well this morning. And there was a line in one of those songs that said, like a mighty storm, may it stir in my soul. And I know Annie at the back there is hearing those words, and she's immediately going to, no, no storms, no storms. Uh, her husband is over in Tokyo. They're expecting a typhoon in the next uh, 24 hours. So I, I'm sure she's a bit mixed on those lines. And so we just uh, we lift up Dean and uh, ask that God would just protect him, all the people that are there, the equipment, etc. The Olympics have started. The Olympics have started. Now, I know it's funny because I don't get a lot of woos here. They're like, yeah, I know, it's weird. You know, we're, yeah, there you go. <laughs> 16 days till he gets home. That's what you're woohooing about. That's what I know. Um, Tokyo has started. A year late, yes, but it has started. And... You know, I've been in watching, you know, watch the opening ceremonies, uh, and it's kind of lackluster because there's nobody there except the people that are on the main floor, et cetera, and doing the events. And, yes, we have a medal already, and that's great. So we're expecting a lot more uh, from – we have two now? We have two uh, going into the third day here, and this is great. And I, I, I want you to know that as I've been doing this series called Olympic Faith, I have really enjoyed the research of this. Because there's so many stories, there's so many good stories about the Olympics and the Olympians over the last 125 years. And um, I, I was reminded again that the Olympic Games, they have a motto. And maybe you don't know about it, maybe you do. And it's been the motto since 1896 when they started the, the, the common, uh, the, the recent and modern Olympic Games. And it's, it's three words. Sitius, Altius, Fortius. It has always been this for the last century or so. Sitius, Altius, Fortius, which is obviously Latin, but in English it means faster, higher, stronger. It's always been their motto, and, and, and it hasn't really been talked about a lot until this week, and I'll mention why later in the sermon. But these three words, and I thought, you know, Paul talks about athletic terms all the time, and I think it actually is, is perfect, and it flows really, really well with the motto that we see in the Olympics. And so what I'd like to do today is, is kind of relate the Olympic theme, the Olympic motto, to the race of faith that we're in. And, and I hope that as I, I share stories about Olympians, that today you'll be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged to, to race your faith faster, higher, stronger. So, Lord, we, just before we sort of get into your word, God, I ask that you would be a blessing to us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing us to gather. Um, and just as I said to my team earlier this morning, just the wonderful piece of connection. We just held hands because we can <laughs> and we just love the human connection. You've given us the heart for that. You are a God of, of community. And so, Lord, I ask that you would just be with us this morning in community, that we would recognize your presence, we would recognize your wisdom, that you would speak to our hearts and change us in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, we pray for our churches this morning, that as they lift up the word of God, you will be lifted up. And in turn, we will be lifted up because of you. And I pray this and protection upon Dean in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sitius, Altius, Fortius. Sitius, the first word in that motto means faster. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul speaks of athletic terms. Now you have to understand why he actually does this a fair bit. He wrote pretty much half of the New Testament. And often in his letters, he refers to military terms, um, he, philosophy terms, and he also refers a lot to athletic terms. You got to understand that the people that he was talking to the Roman and the Greek culture, very physical culture, that the, the ancient games were very, very important to them. And so he tried to use these terms to help them understand this faith that he's communicating to them. So one of those times is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, and it says this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Now, the Olympics have a long history of, of athletes pressing forward, breaking barriers, getting faster, 
and faster and faster. Let me give you an example. So the 100 meter dash, which is kind of, you know, the highlight of the games. Many people kind of say that's like, that's the event, the fastest man in the world, right? At the turn of the 1900s, in the Olympics, for I know they had 110 yard dashes, and it's all, but essentially, the fastest man was going about 11 seconds, which is pretty fast. That's great. By the 20s, they were doing about 10 and a half. And then in the 70s, they began to break the 10 second barrier, which was like, oh, this is incredible. And of course, most of you know that Usain Bolt has the record current at 9.58 seconds. So in 100 plus years, man has potentially, looking at those numbers, a bit faster, about a second and a half in 100 meters, which I think is impressive, but maybe it's not, because you're thinking, well, you know, they used to run on dirt, and the blocks were made out, they had to dig them out of the ground, and they have different shoes now, and they have track and field, um, it's all completely different, equipment's different, the, the f you know, how they timed it is different. Okay, so let's look at swimming. Let's look at swimming. 100 meter freestyle. Okay, same distance, but in water, okay? So you're doing a front crawl. In the early 1900s, the guys that were winning were about a minute, five seconds. A minute, five seconds. The current world record is just over 46 seconds. Water doesn't change, people. Maybe the bikinis do, I don't know, but, but the water doesn't change. Resistance is resistance. And they're about 20 seconds faster than they used to be. Okay, so maybe that still isn't fantastical to you, okay? Let me think about something a bit longer, a little bit more extreme. Look at the men's marathon, which is 42.1 kilometers long. In 1908, they broke the, the three-hour barrier, and the guy that won it did it in two hours, 55 minutes, and some seconds. Two hours, 55 minutes. Okay, amazing. The current world record, I think it was 2018 that it was set. Two hours, one minute, and a few seconds. Okay, yes, they've got better shoes. I don't know, I can't think of anything else that's really equipment-wise here. So in, in just over 100 years, they, they have... Almost an hour more in the marathon. And they really believe that in the next decade, they'll break the two-hour barrier. They're that close. To give you perspective, okay, the guy in 2018, when he crossed the finish line, if he was racing against the guy in 1908, he would have been 13 kilometers in front of him. Uh, there's not enough amazement in the room here. 13 <laughs> kilometers. The winner of 1908 versus the winner of 2018. 13 kilometers separate the two of them. We are getting faster and faster. Why? How is this possible? Yes, okay, we do have equipment things, and we do have digital timing and all that that's better than the thumb that does this, you know, on little stopwatches. We, we understand that, but it's more than that. We are pushing. We are striving as humans. We are starting earlier. We're understanding diet better. We're understanding our bodies better. We train harder. We're just getting faster and faster and faster. In fact, Usain Bolt is concerned that they're going to, well, he actually is pretty, con he's convinced they're going to break his record because they are introducing a new rule of the types of spikes that they can use on the shoes that 10, 15 years ago they wouldn't have allowed. So he's convinced they're going to break 9.58 in the 100-meter dash. We just keep getting faster and faster. And it speaks to the urgency. It speaks to this desire, this strive to be better. And when I think about my own faith and the race of faith, as, as Paul would talk about it, everybody runs Run in such a way to win. Run in such a way to win the prize. In other words, get better. Get, get so good that you're going to win. 
That means training harder, dieting better, running faster. Sidious, faster. Do you guys know the Olympian Jim Thorpe? Some of you do, some of you may not. I didn't know this story. He's an Olympian from 1912, so you may not be familiar with his work. 1912, not 2012, 1912. Jim Thorpe. He was an American runner that, or a decathlete and a pentathlete, and he won both the gold medals in 1912 for the pentathlon and the decathlon. Now, one of the stories that I was reading about this amazing athlete, because he really was an amazing athlete, not just, I mean, you have to be a really good athlete to do these types of sports, because it's not just you're jumping, you're not just running, you're, you're doing everything. He was actually part of the MLB. He was a professional baseball player. He went on to be a professional football player. He, he toured in an in indigenous basketball tour. He actually was going to try for hockey, but he just didn't have time because he was doing so many other sports. He was an incredible athlete, so that one of the gold medals that he was handed to the, the announcer or the, the person that gave him, and he basically said, Jim, you're one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen. So the story goes that when they were on their way to Sweden for 1912, across the ocean, every morning the team would get up, they'd train together, they'd work together. And one, one of the mornings, they couldn't find Jim Thorpe. And so the coach is looking around for Jim, and there he is off in the corner, sitting down with his eyes closed and his head down. A little frustrated. It's like, dude, we're all doing this. You've got to be a part of this. And so we went over to Jim and said, Thorpe, what's going on? What are you doing? We're supposed to be training. And he's like, I am. I am envisioning winning the gold in the decathlon. I don't know how his coach responded to that, but my response to that is like, hmm, training isn't necessarily just physical. He was training. And I feel like there's a lesson there for us that when we push ourselves, when we, when we run the race of faith, sometimes it's a mental game. Because Jim knew what he was capable of. He knew what God had, the gifts that he'd given him. He knew he could win that gold, but he just, he needed to convince himself, I can win this. And so part of his training, as, as you, I mean, even, even the last couple of days, you listen to some of the interviews of the people that are in the, in the Olympics and they're going through their events and, you know, uh, I think it was the, the tai, uh, box, no, Taekwondo, one of the Taekwondo She's like, I, I was ready, I was feeling uh, fantastic, but I, I, it just wasn't there. You know, it just wasn't, it didn't all come together. It did, physical and mental weren't there today. I thought I was feeling good. And, and the, the physical race, the, the spiritual race, there's some similarities here. It's work, it's hard, you strive to be better, but there is a mental game. There is a mental game. And you got to think of Jim Thorpe. If you know him and his background, he was an indigenous Native American. You think being a minority now is hard? You think a century ago. He would have been looked down on. He would have been shunned. He would have been treated so differently. But he didn't let that get in the way. Because that's a mental game in itself, isn't it? Your own self-worth. Even the coach kind of berating him for not, you know, physically working the team. It's like, I need to work on something else. I know I can do it physically. I need to know I can do it here. I plead with you to catch a vision this morning of how God sees you. How he made you. He called you. He's got plans for you. I would say Ephesians 2.10 has been like our church verse. I don't know why it keeps coming up, but it does. Maybe we just, we just continually need to hear it. It says in Ephesians 2, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It does not say that we're a mistake. It says in Scripture that we're a masterpiece with purpose. Not just, hey, you look good. But you've got purpose. And that's a mental game for a lot of us. To think that we are worth something. That God could use me. 
I, I feel like a lot of us Christians, we feel like Christian minorities within the Christian church. Well, we've got the big Billy Grahams, and we've got the big names that are doing great things for God. What am I doing? I'm changing diapers. I'm, I'm changing oil on a car. I'm <laughs> what am I doing for the kingdom like that? But God has already prepared things for you. And you're a masterpiece even before you start doing them. But you need to see how God sees you. He, you need to see that you are that masterpiece and that he has things for you, prepared. Way before you were even born, he had stuff ready for you and you and you. What would it be like if you were to seriously and energetically pursue God's will in your life? What would that look like? To run after the prize for all it's worth. We're running in a race towards a prize. And we don't run half-heartedly. Colossians 3, verse 23 says, Whatever you do, diapers, oil changes, whatever. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord. We are called to go faster. I, I want to be better. I, even I really want to be faster at obeying. When God calls me, I think of Abraham and how maybe that night would have been really, really hard, sacrificing your son. That's what God called him to do. And, and the next morning, he got up early, determined to go. I want to I wanna be like that, trusting God so much that I, I obey faster and faster. It might be a millisecond, but it's just faster. It's better. Because I am the masterpiece of the creator of the universe, and he's got things for me to do. Without a doubt, the quickest distance between A and B is a straight line. And I want to be as straight as possible. I don't want to waver. Let me tell you about another Olympian. Her name was Wilma Rudolph. And she was born prematurely. We start right there, which already gave her some health issues. <clears throat> but she contracted polio early on in her childhood. And it kind of took the use of her legs. And so as a child, she had to wear these braces. And you can think, um, this is in the 50s and 60s, how technology was, probably isn't what it was today. So she had these awkward braces to help her walk. And she was a believer. As a young child, she knew that God did not call her to be in these braces forever. She just had this... This, this sense from the Holy Spirit that this was not her lot, that God did something more. And so she went to the doctors, and she's like, how do I get out of these braces? Just a kid. God doesn't want me in these braces, so help me get out of them. And the doctor said, okay, well, there is a way, but it's going to be really, really hard. And you're going to be in so much pain, and it's going to be so much work for you. The regimen in which I'm going to put you on is going to be so trying. And she's like, I know this is God, and so let's do it. And she would cry, and she went through battling of years and years of getting strength in her legs until at the age of 12, she was able to take off the braces and walk by herself. That's an amazing story in and of itself. I'm not even close to where her story goes. So she wanted to be active like her siblings. Her older siblings played basketball. It's like, oh, I'll go play basketball. The basketball coach look, looked at her saw what kind of skills she had and how awkward and lanky she was, and he wrote her off. It's like, you're, you're hopeless. He actually said, you're hopeless. This is not going to work for you. Try something else, like crochet or something. I don't know what he said. But there was this guy named Ed Temple, and he was the coach for the track and field team, and he said, hmm, I see something here. I see a girl that's willing to work at whatever it is to get it done. And so he took her under her wing. And if I can just sort of side there, Ed Temple. Man, if we all had an Ed Temple in our lives, if you know where this story is going, man, we all need an Ed Temple, Lord. Someone who sees beyond the immediate and can see so much more in you than even you can see. And so he worked with her, and she got faster. And she got faster until she actually got fast enough that they let her on the relay team in the 1956 Olympics. And they got bronze. Amazing, right? No, that's not the end of the story. 
she kept working harder, faster, faster, faster. And in 1960, she represented the U.S. in the 100-meter dash, the 200-meter dash, and the 400-meter relay. And she won gold in all of them. And she broke records in all of them. Wilma is now the fastest woman in the world. From a girl in braces who could barely walk, basketball coaches began to notice that maybe she had something and she ended up being a basketball star in her high school. Go figure, right? But it took Ed Temple to see something different. It took Wilma the striving to be better, to believe that what God had for her was not braces. Now, we don't all necessarily end with a story that we're Olympic champions and, and the fastest people in the world. But, man, this is the glory of God working in one girl. And she'd just say at the end of the race, to God be the glory. But that's not the best part of this hero story. She spent the rest of her life in the toughest and poorest areas in the U.S., encouraging people, being the Ed Temple for somebody else, showing them what they could be in God. That's the legacy that Wilma Rudolph leaves. Let me encourage you in this. Commit yourself to pursue God's will in your life. No matter the cost, run to win the prize. Do it with all your heart. Do you not know, Paul says, that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way to be that person. Sidious, faster. Next word in the motto is altius, higher. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, Brothers, I don't consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let me break this scripture up in two parts. The first half here. Forgetting what lies behind. We've got to forget the failures. I'm not going to go too much into this this morning. But there's a, there's a story of, of an Olympian named Charles Paddock in 1924. He is in the 100-meter um, race. He had won it in 1920. They all expected him to win it in 1924, and he made it to the final. And he's running, and just like Paddock Way, he got off to an early lead, and he's leading the pack. And nearing the end of the race, as he, he kind of hears them coming up on him, for whatever reason that Charles himself doesn't even know, he looked back just to check on where they were. And the British runner ran right by him, and Charles ended up getting fifth. Fifth. If there's not an imagery that's so important for us, to, looking back does not necessarily help us. Now, I understand that there are times when God draws us into the past and helps us heal of the hurts. I know that there are times to do that. But let God decide that, because when you're in the race and God's got you on something... When you're looking back at your failures, it stunts your present. It really struggles your future. Why? Because you're looking that way. And God's like, no, 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 look this way. Forget the failures. Focus on me, on the finish line. Don't be Charles Paddock in that race. Don't look back at the failures. It's such a great image for us to, to recognize from Paul. And you know who Paul is? I, I read this, and I'm like, well, I'm going to totally use that. Paul was a first-class forgetter. If you know the story of Paul, who was Saul, he was, before he came to Christ, he was the guy that was killing and imprisoning all the people that loved Jesus. He was there approving the stoning of Stephen. But when he came to Christ... God forgave him and forgot it. And Paul learned to forgive himself and forget it. He never mentions it in his letters. It's not in his language. 
it's not there. He, he made a lot of mistakes. He had a relationship breakdown with Barnabas. He, he tried with all his might to, to convert Demas. He didn't. He, he had lots of things that he failed at, but that's not what his focus was. His focus was Jesus. And it says in Acts 9, it says that he grew stronger. He grew more and more. He baffled the Jews. He convinced so many people that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, you've got to remember, if he's the one killing the people that are following Jesus and then says, hey, I'm for Jesus all of a sudden, who's going to believe him? He had an uphill battle just to convince the ones that already believed in Jesus that he was on their side now. What an uphill battle that he had. But he had to strive. He had to work hard to convince them. And he did in incredible fashion. And it wasn't in his language about his failures outside of making sure that Christ was glorified in every mistake that he had. And that was the focus, the grace of God, not the failures. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I know so many people who, who won't let themselves get beyond their mistakes. Failures of their past are dragging them down. We must accept forgiveness from our, for our sins from Christ. And we got to forget it. Some people are like, I know God loved the world, but if I was the only one, I don't think he'd do it for me. You ever felt like that? Have you ever said that internally? I have. I know I have. It's like, really, would you do it for me, God? Because, like, I'm not much. And that's, that's some of the stuff we got to get rid of. That's some of the stuff we got to leave behind. Because if God's making you a masterpiece, if he's changed you, if he's made you new, if he's got plans for you, we got to step into that. Focus on him, not the stuff we used to do. Altius, higher. Forgetting what lies behind and straying forward to what lies ahead. Paul then goes on to say, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We are called to the highway. We are called to the high road. If we are in Christ, we are to seek and strive for things above. God's ways and thoughts are higher. Let's strive for those. And I recognize right now that to, to do that, we need him. In and of ourselves, we can't do it. In and of ourselves, we actually need the Holy Spirit to reach those heights that we cannot do on our own. Higher. We should always be shooting higher. 1912. The high jump winner, six and a half feet. So I'm about five seven, five seven three quarters. And I can reach like seven two. So I mean like six and a half is like right around here, okay? So I know I'm on a platform, so this looks like extra cool. But if you were on level, just think about someone jumping unassisted, just running and jumping over a bar that's six and a half feet. That's pretty impressive. I, I couldn't dream of doing that. I have no legs, okay? But the current world record, this is where 1912 was, right? The current world record is eight and a half feet. It's another two feet up. Unassisted, two feet, 24 inches more than the guy in 1912. Eight and a half feet. I can't even, um, I can't even... I don't even understand. It hurts my brain to think that someone can jump their whole body over a, ball, a bar that's eight and a half feet high. But they did it. And it stands as a record today. Higher, higher, higher. My wife and I, before um, pandemic, we were hikers. We used to be hikers. <laughs> my wife, if you've ever hiked with my wife, the goal of my wife is not to get three quarters up the, high, uh, the mountain. It's not good enough for her. She's like a goat. She needs to get to the top. My wife, the goal is the top. It's not three quarters and what a view. Let's keep going. Got to get to the top. And she's been part of parties that, for whatever reason, maybe the weather was too inclement. It was too dangerous. You know, there was lightning or whatever. And they had to turn around. Oh, devastating. Or they were with a group, and some of them just couldn't go any further. They'd done six hours already, and they just couldn't do any more. And, and so they decided to go 
together back down. Horrible. Like this, this is not an accomplishment for my wife. The goal is the top. Higher. It's not here. It's here. And I, I, I love that determination, that tenacity in my wife, because that this three-quarter thing, this half-hearted, this, this almost, get, it's not good enough. I, I think for us in our Christian walk, it takes deep self-discipline. It takes really big self-control, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to go higher. You know, this pandemic forced the church across the world to reach higher. We couldn't get together, and, and some churches had some online presence, but we all realized we all need an online presence. We still need to get the word of Jesus out there. Even if we can't yell it in a room where people can hear us, we're going to yell into a camera as awkward as that was for a year and a half. Hated it. We still knew that the message of Jesus all the more needed to get out. And so we, we got into the social media, and we got streaming, and we got equipment, and we took it higher. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, people were still finding Jesus even when we weren't seeing them face to face. The, the pandemic, it was hard. COVID was awful. But it pushed us to reach higher heights that many churches wouldn't have gone down that road. And, as you can see right there, we have a camera. We're recording this. The sound is being recorded. It's going to be all put together by Pastor Jeremy. I love you. Thank you. And he's going to do all that in midweek. It's going to be up for people to see that missed today. Why? Because we see the importance of reaching beyond just this room. Higher. Altius. Higher. As we compete in the Christian Olympics, we've got to continue to grow. We've got to be better continually. In the power of the Holy Spirit, as he directs us, what seemed like a knock against the church and to be like the powerhouse that God used to get us out there even more. Some of you probably came because you heard of us online. How about that? Altius, higher. The third one is this, Fortius, which means stronger. In 2008... Colombian weightlifter Oscar Figueroa made it to the Olympics in Beijing. In the competition, and I actually watched it, he's going for his second attempt, and he goes to um, clean and jerk, all right? I don't know if you know what that is. You, it's a lot of weight, get up to here, and then you get to here. In the clean and jerk, pulling the bar off the ground, his right arm just flipped right off. So he lost the attempt. Came up for the third attempt. Exact same thing happened. Just. And all the coaches just assumed it was too much pressure. It was a mental game. He just he couldn't wrap his. And he kept saying to them, something's wrong. Some, that's not me. That, you know I can do this weight. And so he just kept saying. And they're like, no, you just you kind of just mentally broke down today. He's like, no, there was something wrong. So he went back home and. They did all the scans and tests, and they realized that he had a herniated disc. Now, I guess that's really not that uncommon to think that you're putting hundreds and hundreds of pounds above your spine. It's going to affect your, your discs. And so he had a herniated disc, and they needed to operate. And the first doctor said to him, I, you know, we need to operate this out. I, honestly, it's, this is too much on your body. You'll probably never lift again. And that was unacceptable to Oscar. And so he's like, I need a second opinion. So he went to another doctor. And the doctor looked all the scans and the tests, and he looked Oscar in the eye, and he said, Oscar, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this surgery. You're going to recover, and you're going to go back to the Olympics, and you're going to win a medal. And four years later, 2012, Oscar got a silver medal at the Olympics. Amazing, right? Not the end of the story. After the Olympics, he went to his coaches and trainers and said, I, I know I could win this. I want to do this one more time. And they're like, Oscar, you're too old. Your body is too beat up. He's like, I can do this. I can get stronger. So he trained, and they're like, okay, fine. <laughs> like, all right, we'll train you. And he 
kept doing well, and he's doing well. And three and a half years in, he's preparing to go to the Olympics. And he injures himself seven months before the Olympics, January, February. He goes back to that same doctor. And he's like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And he's like, you have two herniated discs. And they're going to need surgery. And Oscar kind of waiting for the rest of the line. And the doctor looks straight at Oscar and said, and I'm going to do the surgery. And you're going to recover. And you're going to get stronger. And you're going to win gold. Oscar won gold. But listen. There is something that we need to hear this morning about this. It's amazing to have people believe in you. It's amazing to have people like that doctor, like his coaches, like his trainers. But it does not negate our role in the process. God is your biggest cheerleader. He is the one that can do surgery on you. He's the one that can heal you. He's the one that can provide strength to you. But you have to run. You have to lift. You have to jump. It's a partnership with him. And he can encourage you all that he wants. But if you are in the spiritual fetal position, there's not much that he can do for you because you've got to make the decision to get stronger. You've got to make the decision to allow his strength to come when you're weak. To stand when you don't think you can. Stronger, stronger, stronger. Don't you, you, it doesn't negate our role. I, I'm, not, I'm making sure this isn't all about you. Because we need God. But God is asking you to be who he called you to be. Stronger. Psalm 118 verse 14 says that God is our strength. Hallelujah. I love that. But it doesn't negate our part in the walk. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, with all your strength. God strengthens us. He is the one that gives us the ability. But whatever your hand is at, whether it's the weightlifting bar spiritually, bend your knees and lift that thing. Get stronger. Get into your word. Spend more time with the Holy Spirit. Have more courage. Why? Stand up and do it. Paul reiterates Ecclesiastes in just the chapter later, Philippians chapter 4. He says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can do it with him. Oscar's like, I can't do this unless you operate, unless you train me, unless you coach me, unless you push me. I'm willing to do it. I can do this with the strength behind me. And Paul's using this imagery again. That you can do it with him who gives you strength. Stronger. The finish line's in sight, church. Our goal is the kingdom of God. Our gold medal is eternal life with Jesus. In many respects, it feels like a marathon. In many respects, it feels like that 177 kil kilogram weight. I'm not saying it's easy, but we have a part. Sidious, Altius, Fortius, faster, higher, stronger. I was going to have a really nice close there. And then on Tuesday, they changed the motto of the Olympics. I, I read the headline. Olympic committee votes to change the committee. I'm like, no, I've been working on this for weeks. You can't do this. If you've been watching the news, you'll know that they didn't change the motto. They added one more word. Communite. Which means together. 
I'm like, hallelujah, that is perfect. I can work with that. So on Tuesday, I'm digging into this together, and I, I read this quote from the IOC president. This is why they changed it. He said, solidarity fuels our mission to make the world a better place through sport. And then he says this incredible line, and I'm like, that's my sermon. We can only go faster. We can only aim higher. We can only become stronger by standing together. Oh, I could just close right there. I mean, that's so good. It's just so good. It may have taken them 125 years to get that in there. But the Bible's been telling us from the beginning. You know, if you read the Bible in chunks, you can, you can miss things, okay? You can see all these letters from Paul, and it's like, you do it, do it, do this, shoulda, coulda. You, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Work harder, work faster, get stronger. And that seems like an impossible task by itself. But if you read all of Scripture, you start to see that God empowers you to do all of that. God empowers you to be this and that and go higher and get stronger. And in Scripture, if you read all of Scripture and it's all the way through the Scripture, you will see dozens and dozens and dozens of verses that tell us not to do life alone, that tell us to do life together, that we're a team, that we're not supposed to be lone rangers in this. We are a team, just like the Olympic team is a team. They might have individual jobs and sports, but they go as one team. Sidious, Altius, Fortius, Communite. Let me give you some of those verses that encourage this together motto. 3 John 1.8 He's talking about, therefore, we ought to support people like these. Those are in the ministry. And he says that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Ecclesiastes 4.9, two are better than one because they've got a good reward for their labor. Proverbs 27.17, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Hebrews 10.24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. I love this one, Romans 12.10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. 1 Corinthians 12, 14. For the body is not one member, but many. In essence, this is the simplest and clearest statement about teamwork in the Bible. The body of Christ, the people as a whole, we're a team the body's not supported by one human being. It's all of us working together in the strength of God. We are strongest working together. Teamwork is the key to living life in harmony so that we can do God's will. I was watching the cycling team a couple days ago. And if you know anything about the cycling, there's usually three or four cyclers from each country. But the goal of the team isn't to get all of them one, two, three in the medals. It's not their goal. The goal is that the team helps the one get on the podium. So you might have four on your team. I think the Canadians had three. And those other team members, it's all about Mike Woods. It's not about them. I don't even remember their names. That's how much it's not about them. All of them is like, let's get Mike on that podium. And so they work together in the peloton, if you know what that is, that's the big group of all the, uh, sort of the main group of, of cyclists. They work together, they always stay close together as a team, sometimes they break off or whatever. But as a Canadian team, they're pushing Mike forward. They're doing everything to make it easier for him that he's got the legs at the end. Oh, and he got fifth. Oh, man, there should be medals for fourth and fifth, I'm just saying. We get a lot of fourth and fifths in the summer Olympics, I don't know, just look at the history, it's like, oh, oh, oh. Mike got fifth, but Mike got fifth because of his team. They got him there. It was a team effort to get Mike close to that podium. There are so many 
stories of teamwork in Olympic history. I, I, honestly, it was so fun doing this research, and I'm looking forward to this week as I kind of close out next Sunday, of seeing more and more stories of teamwork and fair play and unity. It's so good. Even within the Christian walk, I know that there's stories of teamwork within the C, capital, capital C Church. But I came across this story from the Olympics in Rio 2016, which was the last Summer Olympics. Maybe you remember it. I'm going to ask Jeremy to cue it up. So we're just about all set for the second heat in the women's 5,000 meters. All eyes will be on Almaz Ayana, the new world record holder over 10,000 meters. in there. She's had a Commonwealth medal over the years. D'Agostino of the USA giving the camera a little wave. Two heats. Five fastest loser spot. Ayana is now leaving the back straight and the rest of the pack have just entered the back straight. Oops. There's a fall at the back of the field here. There's a couple of runners down. And the other athlete who's fallen has decided to stop back there with her. And she is in a lot of trouble, D'Agostino. It's D'Agostino and Nikki Hamlin. Hamlin stumbles on the inside line and then a really nasty fall and an ankle problem there for D'Agostino. The American was initially showing more concern and then realized how much pain she was in. D'Agostino is going to finish this race. It's going to be a very, very painful mile for the American. Brave, brave performance to carry on. D'Agostino is being passed now by Almaz Ayana. It really will be an emotional finish to her race, which will come way after the top five qualifiers. Abby D'Agostino, tears of frustration, and maybe hopefully one day she will look back on this as a moment of great pride, embraced by the woman whose aspirations also came to an end, the ankle clearly hurting. As she decided to finish the race, and that is the very embodiment of the Olympic spirit, alive and well, here in Rio in 2016. My favorite part of this story is not the race itself. It's what happened after the race. And no, it's not actually even the hug that, that the American and the New Zealand actually embraced at the end because they both knew they weren't going to make it. They kind of both finished, but, you know, we're not in final, you know. It's what we came here for. My favorite part of that story comes in one of the lines that just says on the side there, sometimes it's about finishing the race. Both of those ladies fell. The American tried to help the one girl, got her back up and running, and then realized she was so <laughs> injured herself. And then the other girl came back for her. Some good imagery there for our Christian walk, isn't it? When you're strong, you help them. And when they're strong, they help you. But my favorite part of that whole story is that the authorities decided, because they both finished that race, that they embodied what they were all about. They, they were both given a place in the final. And for me, if I can encourage you this morning, if you are a follower of Christ, you have been called to run a race. And some of us stumble a lot 
Some of us aren't leading the pack. Some of us are at the back struggling and hobbling and falling and getting help and getting help again. And, and we're running, but it's, it's pretty labored. And she, she, the American, as you just kind of saw her go to the end, she's limping the whole time. And this is a 5,000 meter race. This, this happened early in the race. She had so far to go. But in our Christian walk, sometimes it feels like that. Sometimes we feel like we're so far behind, God. I'm so far behind. I'm never going to catch up. I'm never going to be what I thought I was supposed to be. But the call of the Holy Spirit is finish the race. Finish the race. Whether you're hobbling past that, she still strived faster, higher, stronger together at the end. And the beautiful thing about this story as we relate it to our Christian race is that the authority, the one that called us to run the race, he rewards each and every one of us with a place in the final. Just finish the race. He's already guaranteed you're going to be there. Our ultimate authority, God, calls us to run hard, to run fast, to run strong and higher. I will strengthen you. He's your coach. He's your trainer. He's your doctor. He's Ed Temple. He believes in you. And by the grace received through the life of Jesus, regardless of your pain, regardless of your journey, you are going to be rewarded. All of us, in Jesus' name. Can I encourage you so much this morning as, as brothers and sisters, if, if that's what you are, if you're lovers of Jesus? God is all of those things for you. But he guarantees, finish the race. I've got a place for you. It's so good to run together. It's so good to run together. We run with God. We run with one another. Can we just pray this morning? Lord, I Lord, I just come before you and I am so thankful for things like the Olympics that bring a little bit of joy in our hearts as we see countries unite. We see solidarity, we see unity, we see fair play, we see these amazing stories of striving we see these amazing stories of encouragement <laughs> well awesome uh, i don't know if that's feeling jesus or not <laughs> i'll let them deal with that so as we close this morning god i ask that you would encourage us that you are our coach, you are our doctor, you are everything to us, and God, you will be glorified. And we don't run this race alone. We run it together, and we run it empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I pray right now, even with this distraction, God, with things falling around me, that you would use this moment as a place of encouragement for us. And if there's someone listening right now that does not know Jesus, who feels like they're running a race, they don't even know what they're running in. They feel like they're just running aimlessly. There's no goal, there's no purpose. God, I pray right now that they would find Jesus right now, right here. That they would say, God, I'm, I'm tired of running my own race. I want to run the race that you've set out for me. Lord, I'm tired of running my life my way and I want to live it for you. And I pray right now that they would just humble themselves before you and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me. I'm putting on your jersey. I'm running for you, and I, I do it in the grace of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Derek. And I'm Pastor Shanga. And thank you for joining us here at Advanced Church Online. It's our hope as a church to help you deepen your relationship with Christ and strengthen your faith. And we would love to connect with you, and there's a number of ways that you can do that. You can email us, you can text us, or you can comment below. And of course, you can always visit our website to get more information about us. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.